All right, let's start. Uh, I'll turn the lights to half. All right, so uh, as indicated first, are there any questions about anything? <laughs> any questions about anything? Yes? When will we get our grade for our first? What? The grade for our first. When will you get it back? Yeah. Uh, in the next few days? Um, you can see all the grading. Uh, actually, no, I haven't. Hmm, I could. I copied all of the grading that you did out, but I didn't actually copy the graded versions of the homework back to you. So I guess I could easily do that. Um, but Simon's going to look through and assign a, an actual grade. Um, but I'm happy to copy all of the graded versions into somewhere in your project so you can just look at that. Since you can then basically tell what your grade will be. I forgot to do that, actually. I just didn't think to do that. Um, but uh, I'll make a note to do that later today. OK, other questions? OK, so um, regarding grading, uh, you'll find that, like last time, there's a folder called grading in your project for this course. Inside of that, there's a subdirectory now called homework two, and it should have exactly three assignments in it. Those are the three assignments that you're going to grade. Also, just like last time, they have grading guidelines, and they file who's who, which if you want, wonder who you're grading, you can look that up in a table. Okay? If you don't have that, you really, really need to contact me because you need it, otherwise you won't be able to grade the three other people. Okay? That's the first thing. Second, there will be a directory homework three in your project that contains the next homework assignment. So uh, make sure that you have that again. And uh, finally, we have collected all of the homework that you graded from homework one, and it is sitting somewhere, and the grader is looking at it, and will then come up with a final grade. Uh, and as was just mentioned, there's no no reason for me to not copy the uh, four graded versions of your assignment back into your project. So I'll do that later today, just so you have access to that, because you're probably dying to see what other people wrote on your uh, homework. OK, any questions about this? So exactly like the previous two times, your grading of the previous homework assignment plus the new homework assignment are both due on Friday at 6 p.m. Okay. Um, let me show you quickly what the next homework assignment looks like. So this is homework three, and here it is. So again, it's going to be sitting in a folder in your project already. It should just be there. You don't have to copy it from anywhere or anything like that. And to submit it, you don't do anything. You just leave it there. And it automatically gets collected. Okay. Um, the first problem, you make up two lists of numbers, and then you do various operations with those lists, which many of which you could do using list comprehensions and so on. You don't have to be super efficient with your operations. There's all kinds of ways that you could solve these problems. Um, the only one that isn't, in a sense, completely straightforward based on watching what I did in class last week is drawing this plot. Uh, but to do this, there's a, one way to do this is to use the point command. There's a command point, which takes as input uh, two, two numbers, and it draws a point. And if you um, add together several of those, then you'll get a plot that has many points on it. Actually, I'll just show you. So if you do point, oops. Oh, it's read only. Uh, so I'll do it at the beginning of the lecture here. But if you want to draw some points, actually there's another command points, I think, which is pretty good for this. If you want to draw points, use the command points. And you just give a, I think, a list of pairs, and it will give you back those points. So notice it drew two points 
whose x and y coordinates are as indicated. So a hint for problem one to draw a bunch of points is use the command points. Which you might have thought of, maybe. Okay, two, there's a problem about working on your project, which involves coming up with three plausible ideas for a project and describing them by giving a title and a three-sentence description. And these are some ideas for ways to come up with ideas for a project. Um, actually, one idea that I didn't list here that occurred to me is, so if you type graphs.tab, there are lots of different graphs that you can construct. But one thing that annoyingly isn't there is something that will make a random, regular, directed graph. So there's a function there, random, regular, which will make a graph but where there's no directions. Uh, it's completely symmetric. But it would be nice to have a random re three regular graph that's directed. Then I could change the grading so that the three people you're grading are not the same as the three people that are grading you. It would be more interesting. <coughs> and more flexible. So a project could be to add a function that constructs such a thing with nice documentation and include it in Sage, and maybe a couple of other graphs while you're at it. That's just an idea for a project that would be useful for courses such as this. Um, but anyway, so there are various resources. There's a link to past courses I've taught. Uh, in there, if you look for other 480s that involve computing, then there'll be lots of examples of projects. There's the track server, this is where we do Sage development. Um, there's thousands and thousands of tickets there. Many, many bugs are listed, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a good source of ideas. Um, you can look in the Sage documentation, just find something and add to it or improve it in some way. Or you could just solve some problem, I don't know. For some reason in this course, people often do things with bus schedules and statistics about how buses move around. So you know, they make a worksheet that, that gets some data from the web and does something with it. So that's problem two. So you're just going to come up with a couple of ideas. You don't have to do a project on something that you come up with here. The point is just to get you to start thinking about possible projects. That said, it's probably a good idea to do a project on something there. Um, the next thing is going to involve just making up a Python class and putting some things in it. And the only requirement really is that it's interesting to you. This is a pretty easy problem. Um, we're going to do really exactly this problem in a few minutes for an example that we'll come up with. That's part of the lecture today, but you'll do something different because it has to be interesting to you, and probably whatever I come up with today isn't going to be interesting to you. So we'll see. And then there's one other problem to make a Python decorator class. It's a class that you can use to make a function. Well, it uses something called decorators, which is a Surprisingly simple and powerful idea in Python, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but what you can do is create, basically anytime you define a function, if you put the at sign and then my logger before it, it'll change the function so that whenever you call it, it saves its inputs and its output in a file. It kind of logs what the function does. So uh, it's a powerful idea once you see how to do this. And what you'll do is implement an example of a nice decorator, okay? All right, that's the homework. So it's all, it's essentially all just uh, being a little bit creative and using Python. Okay, back to today. So that's the homework. Okay, so here are the topics that we'll talk about today. Um, I'll say a little bit about exception handling. Then we'll talk about how to create classes, that is, make up your own data types, really. And I don't think we'll get to decorators today, but uh, maybe we will. I doubt it. OK, so first, let's talk about exception handling. So. Uh, this is something that every uh, reasonable programming language has. And what it, the basic idea is that you can um, evaluate or execute a bunch of code. And you can somehow wrap it in something so that if something goes wrong as the code's executing, then instead of just your entire program blowing up, then you can somehow handle the thing that went wrong and behave accordingly. 
Um, that said, though this is a fairly standard thing, it, is, it can be very subtle in various programming languages. In Python, it works really, really well. It's very nice and clean, uh, powerful, flexible, whatever. I really like it in Python. Um, exactly the stuff we're talking about, I mean, this exception handling stuff is kind of useless if you have lots of threads going on, like highly multi-threaded programming. If you're doing asynchronous programming using, for example, JavaScript or some sort of asynchronous library, exception handling is almost completely useless. But in the context of writing stuff for Sage, mainly Python code, where you do one thing and then another thing and then another thing, and you don't you know, start doing a bunch of other things at the same time, exception handling is super, super useful. And especially in mathematics where you, uh, where there's often functions that only make sense with this, like on a certain subset of the domain and you want to do something special in the case when they don't make sense, you want to raise some sort of error, but you want the function to normally work. Um, this idea of exception handling can really simplify your code a lot. Okay, so let me show you the basic idea. So it's really very simple and Pythonic. You um, have a little tiny word, as with almost every control structure in Python. It's try, and then you put a colon, and then you indent one level and put a bunch of stuff in there. Completely arbitrary stuff. You can define functions, you can do all, all kinds of list comprehensions, whatever you want, inside of the try block. And then you put accept colon, and then you, um, well, I'm going to give you the simplest form and I'll make it more complicated. You put accept colon, and then after that you put what to do if something goes wrong in the try block. Okay, so let's just uh, do a few simple things in here. We'll compute 2 plus 2. We will, uh, I don't know, compute 3 divided by 4. We'll compute, we'll set C to be 0, and we'll let D be a divided by c, which will be bad. We can put accept and we go uh, something bad happened. Okay, so uh, oh, let me put this print nothing bad happened. Okay, so what's going to happen when we evaluate this code? What do you what, what do you think it should do? It should print something bad happened. What about the value of A, B, C, and D after we evaluate this code? What do you think they should be, assuming they're not defined at all before we start? So first, what should A be equal to after we evaluate this code? Four. Four. Okay. What about B? Three fourths. Okay. What about C? Zero. Okay. What about D? Not defined. Okay. Excellent. So let's see what happens. We run it. It prints something bad happened. Now A, B, C, and D, and looks great. So A, it prints out A first and gives four, and then three fourths, and then zero, and then an error because D is not defined. So in fact, you totally know how exception handling works. It works exactly like you wanted it to work. Um, so that's the basics. You just put a bunch of code there, except colon. The, there are a few subtle issues though. In that, okay, so. Oh, and also I mentioned finally. So let me tell you about finally first, and then I'll tell you about the subtle issues. So sometimes you want to evaluate some code no matter what happened. Either everything worked fine, and there were no exceptions at all, or some sort of bad thing happened. But in all cases, no matter what happened, you want to evaluate some extra code. Um, just you know, clear up some, like you want to close a file. Maybe this involves opening a file and doing some things. Something goes wrong, you want to make sure that that file gets closed or some network connection gets closed properly. So, um, clean stuff. That's what it finally does for you. It allows you to put something in here which, after all the other stuff happens, this will happen guaranteed, unless your entire you know, Python process completely crashes. Uh, this is going to happen. <coughs> okay, and there we are. So, that's what the finally business is about. Now, um, the subtlety with exception handling is that you might want to do a little bit more than just run some code and if something mysterious goes wrong, uh, try to deal with it that way. You may want to do something more refined. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong. For example, what if this code takes a while to run and I, hit, I, uh, I click the stop button? Then that'll actually raise an exception that gets handled by the accept. It will um, cause 
a something bad to happen, which is completely different than the divide by zero something bad. There's a whole bunch of different types of bad things that can happen. And so you might actually want to have a whole bunch of different chunks of code to handle different types of bad things that could happen. Right? So you want a more refined version. And there's some bad things that you don't anticipate, and hence you'd want to just get an error message. So you want to be able to handle various things. Not specifically specifying what sort of bad thing might happen is called um, a naked exception. And so these are frowned upon because they are sort of, they're catching every possible exception that could happen. And typically that is, suggests that you haven't really thought about your code very carefully. So let me show you how to do something a little more refined and much more um, powerful. So I'm just going to modify what we had above, but I'm going to make two different types of mistakes. So there was a mistake right there, but let's make another mistake. Okay, so now there's the mistake I've made. Well, what is the mistake that I made? Right, foo bar is not defined. So that error is going to happen rather than the divide by zero error. And it's going to look the same when we run it. It's just going to say something bad happened. Okay, so that's kind of annoying in that you might want to handle the you made a mistake and didn't define your variable at all error completely differently than your divide by zero error. They're just they're a completely different class of problem. And so here's how you can do it. Um, well, first you have to figure out what the error would be, and it's called a name error. You can see it up here, actually. See? So we'll do accept name error. Um, somebody used a variable that isn't defined. And then there's also uh, the exception when you divide by zero, which really, one way to figure out what the exception would be if a certain thing happens is just to cause it to happen and then look and see what it's called. Alternatively, you can look at the Python reference manual where it has a very long list of exceptions. However, you can make up your own exceptions in your own code, so it need not be comprehensive. That said, divide by zero, the error is called zero division error. And notice, by the way, there's a little message here, rational division by zero. It comes after the exception. There's a way to get at that message, which I'll show you in a moment. And an extremely common way to completely mess up in a subtle way, which I'll also show you in a moment. It's kind of amusing until you spend four hours debugging it. Okay, so we know what this is going to do. It's going to say something that or somebody used a variable isn't defined. So let's try it out. Okay, so that worked exactly as expected. Now um, I'll put the zero division mistake a little bit higher or just get rid of the foobar mistake by commenting it out. And now instead of the other thing, we see somebody divided by zero. Okay, so you can get... So you can write code that handles this case, or you can write code that handles that case. And there could be you know, a whole bunch of different cases that you handle. Yes? If we want to have the same except that mom just has two errors versus the mom uh, You'd think. Um, and well, I guarantee you that millions, well, not millions, but thousands of people have done exactly that, including me, and then spent hours and hours very confused, because that actually, well, let's, let's just try it and see what happens. Um, that seems like a completely reasonable notation. So, four, and watch, we're not going to get a syntax or anything. Let's evaluate it. Seems to have worked just fine. Woohoo! So... <coughs> Guess what? Um, we've now completely borked everything in a massively confusing way. Watch this. Uh, let's see. Instead of showing you how you discover this, I'll just print out two things. So zero division error. It's an exception. You can just print it out. It's like an object like anything else. Let's look at what name error is now, though. <coughs> name error is 
the particular zero division error that we hit. This is not good. What we just did was we wrote some code that says if it raises a zero division error, assign the actual error message, like the, the exception object, to the second variable, which we happen to call name error. So now name error is equal to the actual error object that we got before. And now when you try to catch name error, it'll never work. Like if you were to put, you know, accept name error somewhere else in your code, it'll just mysteriously not work, which is very confusing. Um, so try not to do that. I did it many times, and it hurt. So, so look, here's the, here's the notation for catching an exception and getting the message, like the actual exception object. It's like that. So that's kind of bad. Um, if you want to catch two different exceptions, let's see. Let me uh, clean this up. So zero division error, somebody divided by zero, and then we'll just put the message right there. And to do two different ones, you have to do this. You give a tuple. You can actually catch a whole bunch of different things like value error. Um, and you can also put like message like that. So you don't put them separated by commas. You put them explicitly as a tuple. And it's particularly confusing because everywhere else in Python, if you put commas between two things, it just makes a tuple. So it's really, really bad. Um, I think in Python 3, this has been changed. So slightly. So it's just not allowed to do something. I don't know. They, it's been addressed somehow in Python 3. but. Um, I need to fix that. Okay, so this actually won't work correctly because name error, as I mentioned, we actually messed it up. So right now, this is going to not behave correctly. This will catch either zero division error or not something that is now called name error, but is actually the error message itself or value error. So um, if you run this code right now and we put the foobar thing back in, it's going to have a very painful behavior. Look, instead of catching the exception and printing stuff out, oh wow, oops, um, here's what happened. Uh, yeah, so it gives us this big exception. And that's because name error is not equal to the actual exception object name error, it's this message that we got before because of using the wrong notation. By the way, notice one nice thing is the clean stuff up uh, message still got printed. Even if there's some exception that occurs in your code that you don't catch, finally will get called. Even if no exceptions happen, finally gets called. Finally always gets called. Unless you completely crash the program, which of course you can do. But as long as you don't do that, then finally gets called. Um, so how do we fix the name error? One way is we could restart our saving <coughs> session by clicking the restart button. That just completely kills the entire session and restarts it. There's also a reset command, which um, you can give it something. So I'll just go right here and type reset name error. What this does is it resets any kind of any identifier to be what it was when the process started up. And I'll print it out just to verify that it really worked. I've never reset an exception before. Yep, so now it's back to being name error. So that's great. So remember that if you, um, just to give you an example of this, what did somebody do? I don't know, somebody sent me, somebody in this class last week, I think they, they're like, the min function I think doesn't work anymore. It like doesn't have any of the right methods and it's completely messed up. And I think they had just said, did something like min equals five. And now min, the function, the built-in function, no, it was prod, I think it was prod. Yeah, so they were like, yeah, clearly the person had done something like prod equals 5, or at least it assigned it to the result of a calculation. And then when they tried prod 1, 2, 3, it doesn't work. And the reason is because now prod is that integer. You can overwrite almost anything that is defined when you start up the system. It'll silently let you overwrite it with, you know, a random number or something like that. So watch out. And it's easy to accidentally do that. Um, you know, there are a few things like reserved keywords, like you can't overwrite for or if, but you can overwrite almost everything else. And not surprisingly, the way to fix this, if you want your prod back, 
one way is just to say reset prod. And now you can say prod123. Whoa. <laughs> And then it works. All right, so that is the basics of exception handling. Let me just show this and then quickly summarize. You say try colon and then indented. You give anything you want, pretty much. And it could be many, many it's not just a sequence of instructions, it's completely arbitrary Python code. So define classes, define functions. All kinds of stuff, nested for loops, whatever you want, goes inside of there. Then accept colon or accept and then some stuff, which you have to be careful about because there's one gotcha that every, I mean, it's like the, one of the most standard Python gotchas. Um, but this is the general notation. You give a tuple of exceptions and then optionally the message separated by a comma, a colon, and then you indent, and this is the stuff you do in the case that one of those exceptions occurs. And you can have various cases, and then there's a finite. And many other languages that you've hopefully used have exceptions uh, that are similar to this. OK, any questions about exception handling in Python? OK, let's move on to defining a class. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to define a simple class that's probably not in Sage because it's kind of silly, or maybe in some ways in Python, called hour, which represents an hour. So it'll be a number between 1 and 12 and AM or PM. But a fun thing about it is it's really like the numbers modulo 12, or I guess it's really the numbers modulo 24, but with funny names. So since you're all math people, you know what I mean by the numbers modulo 24. Okay, so let's define a class called hour. And here's how it works. We're making a data type that represents the idea of an hour. So there's, we're going to use write class hour, and then we're going to put some code here. Basically, it'll be a couple of function definitions that describe how, how this data type behaves. And then suddenly, we'll be able to make, um, just like we can make lists and ints and strings and all those other things, we'll be able to make hours and print them out in some nice way. And we'll even be able to add operations to them. Like, if you have two hours, you can add them together. And it'll give you something back. OK? So that's what we're going to do as our example. So the notation for defining a Python class is, again, very similar to the notation for defining everything in Python. You have a keyword, and then some name, and optionally some stuff in parentheses, and then a colon, and then everything else is indented one level. And you can put all kinds of stuff in there. Okay. Um, for now, we won't need to put anything here, but uh, just, uh, I mean, what would typically go here would be names of various classes that your class derives from. They will automatically have all the functionality of all the classes that you list in parentheses. But we don't need anything for our first very, very basic example. I'm going to make this ridiculously simple to start with. So for the most part, if you make a brand new class, you'll almost certainly have um, some sort of initialization. So um, you have to give a function that creates an object in this class. So, uh, so let's see, I'll give the hour and then whether it's AM or PM. Um, let's see, there's a lot of ways, there's a million arbitrary decisions that go into this. So, uh, that's what we'll do. Okay, so this isn't too complicated. What this does is we'll make a type. In order to create an hour, you have to give two things a number, and whether it's AM or not. So that's, what, that's the way we'll do it. And once you create an hour, it will then set those two attributes of your instance, 
and then you can do stuff with it. Okay, so let's evaluate this. And we now have a new class, hour. And so we can make an hour. I'll call it uh, H. And let's see, what is it? It's one. Is it AM or not? Uh, some other client is viewing this and messing it up. It's getting annoying. Okay, I'm going to switch to... Another worksheet. Okay, so I'll evaluate this. And now we have a new class called Hour. This is more. This is very similar to the other data types like stream, etc., that you have. Except we just made it up from scratch, and you can model a large number of different interesting things this way. Um, so let's make our hour. I'll call it H for hour. We're just going to make a specific instance of an hour. This is like a template for um, for hours, and we're going to make a specific instance, which I'll call one. And then it's not in the morning, so I'll say false for the AM attribute. Okay? It's kind of boring because it just prints out I'm an instance of hour. And it's also kind of boring. All you can do with this thing is do h.hour and it'll print out one and h.am and it'll print out false. Okay? But we've now made a Python class. Fortunately, uh, there are a bunch of things we can do to make this Python class a lot nicer. We can make it print out in some nice way where it'll print 1 a.m. or p.m. We can do arithmetic with it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So first let me explain in more detail what's going on here. So and it is those uh, little underscore looking things are two underscores in a row. So it's underscore, underscore, and then the word init. So that's what's before there. Often when people talk, they call it a dunder method. Dunder meaning double underscore. <laughs> dunder. OK, so because it's really hard to see, it just kind of looks funny. So what you do is you have a dunder method init. And classes typically have such a thing where they inherit it. And it will get called when you create an instance of your class, as in line 111. And it gets called with three things. So it looks like you're calling with two things right here. And in fact, you're making, you're calling the class itself with two things, but it's dunder init method gets called with three things. The three things being very explicit, they're the actual instance of the class, which is by convention in Python called self, and then the other two uh, inputs to init. So you could call this self anything you wanted, but people would frown at you if you called it this or something else, um, like you do in other languages. Uh, in a lot of languages, it's kind of implicit that there's something where the self is, and they use a different notation for referring to it. But in Python, you just, all these dunder methods, almost all of them have self as their first argument, and it's just the specific instance of the class. It's actually pretty nice and uh, clean. Uh, of a design, but it's different than a lot of languages because it's so explicit. Okay, so let me show you another Dunder method, which already starts to look nice. Um, we can customize how hours are printed. So you do Dunder wrapper, and now you return a string, and now your hour will be printed that way. So let's. Um, so now you have to start thinking: How do you want to print an hour? So we're going to print either AM or PM. And so you get to actually write interesting stuff. So I'll write percent %s, percent %s, and then we'll have the hour. And notice you explicitly refer to self right there. If you were to put something different here instead of self as the first argument of wrapper, you just have to put the same thing right here. You should never do that, but if you did, that's what you get. Um, and then for am or pm, we'll do, we'll print am if self.am, else we'll print pm. So that's a conditional expression that evaluates to am if self.am is true, otherwise it evaluates to pm. 
You could also use an if statement and you know have two different returns. Okay, so let's evaluate this. And now it's a new class. Notice the address changed. But the cool thing is now it prints a little bit more nicely. When we print out H, it prints 1 p.m. rather than some ugly looking thing. Kind of wish there was no space here. So I'm going to get rid of the space. And now it prints that way. And you could do uh, 10, 10 p.m., etc. But there's no error checking at all, of course. You could do 0 p.m., which is kind of weird, um, etc. So the one thing, I showed you how to catch exceptions by using try except. I didn't show you how to throw exceptions, how to make them happen. Um, but this is a prime candidate for, where, for how to do that. So when the person passes in the hour, let's make sure it's an integer, but also if it's, uh, say, less than or equal to 0 or it's greater than or equal to 13, we'll raise a value error. We'll say hour must be between 1 and 12. And similarly, we can make sure that the AM or PM marker is a Boolean. All right, now again, uh, we can make our class, but here we're going to get a big error, as expected. However, if we were to put in a valid hour, then it will give us a little more time. So let's try a valid hour, like 1, and then it works fine. So to make an error appear that could be caught with try except, we use raise. So it's really try except, finally, and then raise. That's the one other thing to know about. Okay. Uh, so we raise the value error. Yes? What if we put something like an integer value that's the Boolean parameter? It'll false? convert it to be either true or false, okay. if at all possible. And Almost everything in Python can be converted to be true or false. Yes? Uh, is value error? <coughs> what? Is value error what? Actual error? It says, it no, value error is a built-in Python exception. If you look at the Python reference manual, then you'll find a long list of about 30 or so exceptions. They actually form a hierarchy. Um, some of them derive from other ones. And value error is one of the standard ones that's built into Python. You can define your own if you want, but... Um, this one is a very commonly used one. I avoid defining my own exceptions because there's quite a few that are built in Python. Okay, so that's nice. So yeah, you could uh, anything that's you know truth, truish. So uh, anything that's kind of truish will become true. And see so that gives us something. It's not because it's in the morning. If I said afternoon, it would still come out AM because it's true. So any non-empty string is true, the empty string is false. There's a whole bunch of funny rules like that, where any, like a non-empty list is true, but an empty list is false, stuff like that. So, so that's kind of nice. And of course, if I were to put 13, I'd get an error again. Okay, and now, uh, let's see. The next nice thing that you can do is arithmetic. Okay, so to define a, to make it so that uh, the following works, so it'd be kind of fun if we could do, I don't know, uh, hour one, and then we'll make the AM PM thing be, so it's the afternoon, plus hour uh, three in the afternoon. We'd want to give some meaning to that. So I haven't evaluated the top, and I hadn't finished writing that. It's just going to give an error. There's no, it's not a supported type. But wouldn't it be nice if we could just add together times? That would be good. So let's define a way of adding together two times. And uh, what we'll do is define a method, a gender method called add. And there's similar methods for mole, sub subtract, powering, et cetera. And we'll make it, it can return anything at all, but we'll make it return an hour that's a result of adding together two hours, okay, using plus. So first we have to decide, what is this even going to mean? There are many arbitrary ways in which you could define addition of two hours. But I think um, what we should do is, well, you can, I mean, there's a lot of ways. We could convert the hour to a number between 0 and 23, and do that with the other one, add them together, reduce mod 24, and then put it back to be in this form. Um, 
we could just add the underlying hour and then if do like a whole bunch of funny if thens depending on whether one of them is am and the other one isn't am, et cetera, et cetera. And then try to normalize. I mean, your code can actually get pretty complicated right here if you think about it. So um, how about let's do this? So we'll define um, a military time. This is going to be a method that we can call on an hour object. And it will give us back a number in military time, which I think an hour in military time, I think, is between 0 and 23. And if it isn't, we'll just say it is. And we'll just add together the two times in military time. We have to define this. We haven't yet. And we'll get back a number. I'll just call it n for the moment. And then uh, we'll make a new hour. Let's see. Where, actually, I guess we could just take n and reduce it mod 12. And then that'll usually give us the hour, except if, I'll just kind of draw this out. If it's 0, then we have to add 12 to it. And Let's see, we don't want to forget the AM, PM part, so but I think we turn our this, and then whether or not it's AM or PM just depends on whether our is greater than or equal to, or N actually is greater than or equal to 12. But actually, it's the other way around, less than 12. Because it's we put true for the second one if it's a, in the morning, if it's AM. So I think that if we write... So now what we have to do is define another method that gives us back the time in military time. When what happens? Oh, no, but you by 12. Yeah, I'm by 12. These numbers can get all big, but um, it gives me 23 plus 23, but I'm always just modding out by 12. This is the uh, AM PM thing's probably completely wrong, though. Yeah, it's definitely wrong. I'm going to leave it in, though, and just say it's a bug because I want to. Uh, so I want to focus more on implementing the military thing and how this works. So, by the way, I think it, even writing some code that you know has a bug, namely whether or not it gives the AM or PM correctly, um, isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you're sure that you're going to deal with it soon. So, in this case, yes, this is definitely going to give the wrong answer sometimes. Um, because if you added in, if it were 23 and 4, when you added those together, you'd end up getting something that's AM time. But it would be wrong because it would be like 27 or 28. So this is definitely wrong, but we'll fix it in a minute. More importantly, though, let's get the code to work. If I try to run it right now, it's just going to completely fail because I haven't even defined this military function. So let's define that first, get this to work, and then fix the bug. So we'll define a method. And you can define, so the dunder methods they do special things like um, let you overload the plus operator, um, let you make your object print in some nice way, etc. cetera. Um, but you can define other methods that don't begin with double underscore and end with double underscore. And you can just define hundreds and hundreds of methods like that. So let's define one that returns the time in military time. And so what's it going to do? It's basically going to return self.hour, but if it's not in the morning, we'll add 12 to it, right? Um, plus uh, let's see, 0 if self.am else 12. So this is a little conditional expression that evaluates to 12 if am is false, otherwise it evaluates to 0. And so that converts from am pm notation to military time. Except, uh, let's see, this is definitely going to be normalized to be between 1 and 24. What is military time between 0 and 23 or 1 and 24? 0 and 23. Okay, so let's just take it and reduce it modulo 24. There. The only funny case would be if the result were 24, and then we would want 0. So now it's in military time. Okay? So this gives us back our number in military time. This allows us to add two numbers. This will work in that it will give us an answer, but the answer will sometimes be wrong because of the AMP and being wrong. Okay? But we can evaluate this code now. We can try it out. We can see that it at least runs, but it gives us invalid answers in some cases. Okay, so we evaluated it, or I evaluated it, and now 
Uh, let's try adding together two things. And at least gave us a number. It's wrong, but it gave us a number. And also notice if you do this, um, this is misleading. So false. So it says 7 p.m. You can do h.military, and it gives you back the time in military time. Okay, so we've done a lot. We've just, we've, yes? Can hour only be applied to, or can military only be applied to hour? Exactly. So if you do, um, if you make some other class, like, I don't know, n equals, just make some something like n equals 78, an integer, then if you do n.tab, you'll find all kinds of handy things in this long list, but you will not find military even available. If you try to do n.military, it will just laugh at you. Whoops. It'll say attribute error. It's not there. Okay. It only makes sense to, so this is, just boom. It only makes sense to call military on objects of type hour. Okay. It's a, uh, it's like an attribute of all the instances in military. We have this function. But if you do h.tab, you'll see that there's the attributes we define, like am and hour, but there's also this function military, which we can now call, as we did. Okay, so let's look at our class again for a minute. We've defined a class called hour. It has a constructor, which lets us make hours. It has a nice way of printing itself, which looks neat. Um, it has little to do with how we would input the number. Uh, we have a function that converts our time to military time. And it's kind of nice, you can define all these um, functions without putting very much code in them, and then you end up organizing your code nicely. Because you actually have to do some thinking to figure out how to do this conversion. But it's nice to clarify exactly where the hard thinking part is versus just you know, defining stuff uh, and organizing things. And then add, finally. And the only problem now is our AM and PM is messed up. So now let's fix that. So we need to think a little bit, how do we decide whether the time that we get should be AM or PM? And that, of course, um, depends on whether uh, n mod, well, so when you do this reduction, I guess all we need to do is reduce n mod 24 and then look to see whether it's bigger than 12. So, or bigger than or equal to 12. Oops, n mod 24 greater than or equal to 12. Uh, wait, we want to check whether it's am or not. So we just check if it's less than 12. There. I think that's right. So n is the sum of the two times of military time. If you reduce it by 24, that gives you this, the result of adding the numbers together in military time. And a military time is am exactly when it's less than 12. So, there you are. so now let's try it out. And now we can take and add together hours. 1 p.m. plus 4 p.m. is 4 a.m. I'd be mean, sorry, 1 p.m. plus 3 p.m. is 4 a.m. Um, which is great. So, so if we set an hour equal to 1 p.m., that's h. And you could do something like, what happens at a, basically a 23 hours later. So h plus that is noon. And so it works out nicely. Okay. And then you might think, oh, it'd be nice to have a method that will tell me, you know, what time is it 50 hours from now? And you just add another method that would do that sort of thing. Okay. So hopefully that illustrates the basics of making classes.